And um, she's happy for questions during the presentation. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll deliver you the mic. No. Yeah, how's that? Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Liz Henry, and I want to talk about open source assistive tech um, and about hacking and do-it-yourself projects. Um, and I don't want to really just do a list of, hey, here's some open source projects, um, although I will have a few slides for that. Uh, what I'd like to do is just talk about the philosophy of, of stuff that we consider assistive tech um, whether it's a tennis ball on the bottom of your walker feet or whether it's software. Um, and so um, I think that there's some commonalities between, the, between those things that, that will be very instructive. Uh, for example, my wheelchair is just a machine to get my body from one place to another. And I'd really like it to be easy to, oh, what? I'd like it for it to be easy to fix and to hack like a bicycle or a car. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, you can easily find information on how to fix a car. There's tons of manuals. You can go to a car repair place. And because of that amount of information and transparency that exists for car engines and cars in general, anyone can start a car fixing business. So there's an enormous ecosystem and industry built around that uh, quality of information. Um, so car fixing businesses are obviously everywhere. And it's pretty easy to get your car fixed, and it's pretty cheap, even though a car is a gigantic killing death machine. <laughs> you can also find out how to fix a bicycle fairly easily, and there's a whole movement um, that are like radical bike power movements. Uh, this is one, the Bicycle Manifesto by Sam Tracy. It's very cool. And there's also a big system built around bicycle shops and bike f fixing and a bike industry. But you can't find out how to fix a wheelchair or how to build a wheelchair. Um, and that's a, a really interesting question. Why should that be? There's nothing particularly different about this um, from a bicycle. Uh, there are some qualities that are different, like if you're sitting in your wheelchair all day long, you might get pressure sores, so you need to be very aware of positioning. But that's also true of a bicycle. Um, a bicycle rider who rides in a, uh, 50 miles a day is also going to have that, uh, uh, problems like that. But because of, rather than just being seen as a tool like a bike or a car or a computer, uh, wheelchairs and other assistive technology are seen as medical devices. Um, why should you care about this? Not just because you're kind <laughs> and you love disabled people, but because you will probably be disabled or have a significant physical impairment for around eight years of your life. That's the average for industrialized countries. Um, you're a temporarily able-bodied person if you're able at all. Uh, for example, hands are important. Um, a lot of us as programmers, as developers, um, or even just computer users have to deal with RSI problems, with irritation, with pain. People invent stuff to help with uh, hand problems all the time. But that technology tends to be either proprietary and expensive or somebody's fabulous idea that they published in 1976 in a little book uh, or in some blog that they started and then abandoned. So it's actually kind of hard to find that information. People aren't sharing it super efficiently, and there's no repository of awesome information for you know, hand stuff. Um, there are attempts at building that. But since they tend to be started by people with hand problems, uh, <laughs> good luck. Um, this uh, illustration is kind of interesting. It's from a book called Handmade Helps for the Disabled for Disabled Living. And it was one of those books published in like 1981 in Britain. It's out of print. It's almost impossible to find, and it costs $50. Um, and it's a fantastic book. Um, what would be wrong with just putting this book online? I've written to the publisher a million times. They won't answer me back. It's a shame. I'm ready to basically scan it and stick it up online. Um, voices. Everyone needs a voice. Um, but Here's my point about the medical industrial complex. In the last few years, the company called Dynavox has bought every other voice uh, banking and voice uh, reading uh, screen uh, uh, technology. iResponse Technologies, Meyer Johnson, and Keter Research blink twice, and a whole bunch more. You can just look at their press releases. It's kind of crazy. So assisted and augmented communication is actually big business. Um, and this is because uh, it, it's a huge amount of money you can get from people's insurance companies. You can get from government agencies that assist the disabled. You can charge, you can get away if you're a medical device company uh, with charging an enormous amount of money. So it's big business. Um, why should you care? Back to the point of why you should, why you should care. Until you need it, you may not care. Uh, when you do need it, you may be busy, very busy, <laughs> dealing with your problem, 
poor or in pain. Uh, so it gets actually proportionally harder to invent it at the moment when you need it. Um, and I think also we have a generational problem, which is our view of progress depends a little bit on science fiction concepts of like nanobots. So we think that maybe, you know, uh, I, I love the, um, what's the, uh, the nanobot guy, K.R.F. Drexler, love him. But, you know, we read this book in the 80s and all went, oh, yay, we're going to be immortal. And, you know, maybe didn't work hard enough on actually developing technologies to deal with problems, hoping that the problems were all going to just get fixed. Um, so why isn't there more free and open source access hacking on things like wheelchairs? Why aren't there just plans published online? Um, I think part of this is the money and the profit motive. Part of it is um, social prejudice and the model of um, we have something physically wrong with our bodies and we are not allowed socially to then control our bodies. The bodies are sort of a danger zone. Um, it could expose people to liability. You'd be amazed. Uh, there's a guy who publishes, uh, who had a very fantastic GeoCity site about how to build little wheelie carts for his uh, kitten that he adopted that had uh, uh, paralyzed back legs. He had legal disclaimers all over it. Don't try this at home. I am a certified vet. I am an orthopedic veterinarian. I mean, really. Uh, so people are afraid to publish plans for assistive devices um, because they're afraid they're going to get sued. That's in the U.S. I don't know how that goes other places. Um, I think also there's a charity model operating where people with disabilities, not a uh, uh, print working directory, PWD stands for people with disabilities, uh, uh, a model where we are passive recipients of charity. So we are disabled, which means we're helpless, which means people have to help us and we can't do it ourselves. And this is actually a, a, a terribly flawed model that leads to great evil. Um, for example, um, I wrote, to, well, you know what, I'll get to that later. Um, I'll just keep going down my slides. People with disabilities are also often isolated from a community. If you're stuck in assisted living or if you have difficulty getting out of your house, which you may, uh, then you're not in touch with like necessarily a, a community of other people who are dealing with uh, similar problems and who are trying to hack them. Um, however, people do have to hack them. Like I have to invent stuff all the time just to get around my own house or to deal with problems. Um, I think we all, um, we all have that uh, in, in common is that uh, necessity drives us in, in our invention. But these solutions are often individual, so they're tailored specifically to what, we, what I might need, may not be what another person needs. But then I don't have a clear pathway to sharing information. Um, because the solutions are so individual, people think maybe there's no point in sharing them. But I think that there is because we need, uh, in order to think of an adaptation, often I think we need to see a model for what are other people doing. Uh, and it needs to be somewhat viral in communication. Um, again, going back to the profit and greed motive, um, because this is dealing with, with our bodies and with impairment and with uh, what I'm calling the social model of disability, um, which is very interesting to read about if you just Google it up, social model of disability, um, our bodies are seen as being under the control of the medical industrial complex. So our wheelchair repair manuals or voice control hacks might get us uh, sued. Uh, if somebody is injured, you know, the wheelchair falls apart might violate copyright or a patent and might ruin someone's profit. This is a, a huge problem. Uh, however, because you will likely spend several years of your life disabled, you will need assistive technology. And because we are who we are in open source, you will want to hack that technology. You'll need a do-it-yourself attitude about access. You don't, can't just wait for someone to give you the awesome device that's going to help you out. You'll need open source information structures, which we have developed, in which I think we need to spread throughout more communities of inventors and makers. Um, so we'll need open source in, in information structures and communities. Um, vision, speech, and gaming, I think, are making the greatest strides uh, because people are highly motivated to, to, to use the internet for these purposes. But mobility mods, like wheelchairs or walkers and things like that, aren't really integrated with open source culture. So when you have sort of a non-computery device, people aren't really open sourcing that. They go, huh, maybe I've invented this gadget that's a fabulous one-handed can opener. I think I'll patent it, instant path to evil, and sell it to some medical company, which will then sell it for $1,000. <laughs> oh, so this is, this is a terrible situation. Uh, so talking about physical um, things, let's get physical. And I have a picture of Olivia Newton-John here. It's kind of awesome. Um, I have a sometimes obvious and sometimes not physical impairment. I'm using a wheelchair. People actually 
because of that, people ask me questions about web accessibility. I think this is the funniest thing I've ever heard. So because like my legs don't work so well, they think that I automatically, through some kind of dis disabled person osmosis, know about web access. And I'm like, why would I know? I mean, solidarity has inspired me to try to find out more about it and to come and give talks like this. Uh, but uh, be, I think that, that that assumption actually, while humorous and I want to mock it, it actually exposes something very important, which is that disability isn't actually about uh, what is, your impairment specifically is. It's a, this social construct of something in, in people's minds that, that because you're disabled, you're sort of this other and you're this category and therefore, you know, you all know each other. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> How do I work the foot pedals at the bottom of the web pages? Um, I'm really bad at that, but if you really want to know that, you should ask Nick Steenout, who uh, has a whole web accessibility business and is here at the conference, and you'll see him rolling about with his uh, wheelchair and his ponytail. He's the guy in the wheelchair without the sparkly wheels. <laughs> I'm the one with the sparkly wheels and the purple hair. Um, <laughs> so that commonality in people's minds actually just exposes uh, the need for solidarity in the ways that politically we do have uh, this commonality. Um, so how are software web access uh, and things like that projects uh, handled compared to projects about physical mobility gadgets and inventions? This is my excuse to talk about physical hacks and do it yourself, which I love to talk about. Um, my first one I'd like to talk about is the tennis ball walker. Uh, this is incredibly common. If you see somebody with a walker, often uh, they have tennis balls stuck onto the, the, the front feet because it helps you glide over little cracks and bumps. Otherwise, you just go, you hit a bump, in a, a brick in the sidewalk or something, and you just go, you know, tumping over. It sucks. Um, it's simple. It's cheap. It's really effective. It works. Uh, the wheelchairs tend to have a standard size of uh, foot that fits nicely into a tennis ball, which is also a very standard object. It's easily noticed. Tennis balls are like bright green. And you see this tennis ball fuzzily at the bottom of someone's very clunky looking, hospitally looking device, and you notice it. And because it's easily noticed, it's also easily copied. So I think it's one of the sort of success stories, in a way, of do it yourself disability hacks or ability, uh, hackabilityness. Um, but the, the, the fail part of that is that even though everybody's been doing it for 40 years, it's still necessary. Why don't they make wheelchair? You know, I, I don't know whether you consider it a feature or a bug. But um, these uh, walkers um, have evolved somewhat over the years, but they still make these standard clunky ones because um, they get ordered by hospitals in bulk and um, they're cheap, I guess. I don't know. Regulation, that may be so. But uh, the regulations go out the window when people instantly stick um, tennis ball stuff on there. And th there are good um, web guides if you just go look. But it's all like buried eight levels deep in some forum of some personal dude's you know, forum. Actually, they're on Wheelchair Junkie, which is a great forum run by Mark E. Smith. Um, but you know, somebody will say, here's how I did it. I, I razor bladed this uh, tennis ball apart, and I used epoxy, and I used this rubber thing. And so uh, there, there are some people doing that. But it tends to be quite individual, and nobody's really collecting it in one spot. Um, here's another individual solution. Uh, these are my crutch pockets. You would think that it would have occurred to somebody over the many years of crutch development that pockets are awesome because your hands are full of crutch and you want to carry your book and your Kleenex and your cell phone and your, your bottled water from room to room. Um, so I made these crutch pockets out of duct tape. They're awesome. They lasted for 20 years. Um, here's another one, very easily virally spreadable. Um, it's starting to be a manufactured thing now. You can go online and buy crutch pockets that cost you like $40 and have Velcro. And, yeah. Um, but nobody's really published plans for making crutch pockets online. And that's something that I'd really like to see happen. Uh, crutch holders on a bike. Crutch holders on a bike. This is uh, my friend Hedere's bike. Um, she has difficulty walking, but she can ride her bike really great. Um, the lesson here of these crutch holders um, are not to assume. So you're designing something. You want to make it accessible. Um, and people's abilities vary. You may not think somebody who uses a wheelchair and some, some elbow forearm crutches can ride their bike, but they, 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 may, they may surprise you. So people's abilities do vary from day to day and hour to hour. The negative lesson of these uh, crutch holders is that this is actually kind of how I think about a lot of web accessibility or people's assumptions about it. They think, I have this device, and it works normally for normal people. And then we'll just bolt on some shit at the end of the process of development of this software, and then we'll make it work for somebody else. And I really want that attitude to change as well, so uh, to where uh, things are more integrated from the beginning. Uh, software is not an easy hack. Those uh, things I just described, the crutch holders, the, the crutch pockets, and the tennis ball walker are sort of are examples of things that are very easy to do, 
have very common materials, and you can just bolt them on to your standardly produced device. Software is not easy. Uh, this is a picture of Speedy Kitten, the kitten in the, the little uh, a, a Lego cart that I mentioned before. It's awfully cute. Um, Computer and web access is treated as an easy hack, something that you just individually bolt on at the end of software development. Um, add some alt tags to your images, woohoo! Stick hand controls on your gas pedal in your car. Be sure to patent it and sell it for a jillion dollars while you're at it and screw everybody. This creates many problems. It doesn't really make for a viable do-it-yourself or free and open source culture. Uh, oh, I have one more easy hack out of order, sorry. This is an easy hack, but it's an interesting one. It's not so much a physical hack as it is an information one. Labeling tape. Um, so uh, those Dymo tape clicky thingies that you may have used as a kid um, or may use now um, are great for uh, visual impairment because you can, you can make little uh, feelable labels. Um, another one uh, that I, I thought was very clever was a guy was telling me about using control languages for voice-activated devices. So as he's talking to his computer, um, he actually uses um, Icelandic to control, to, to, to switch modes to be like a, a modal switch into I'm now telling the computer what to do with the menu, and then he'll start typing again um, by talking, by switching back to English. Oh, I thought that was really interesting. Um, sticking address labels on your crutches. I did that. I saw some guy do that at a cafe, and I thought, oh, my God, I've lost so many canes by leaning them up against my car while I'm pumping gas. Um, <laughs> it would be great to have the address label on the device. So that's another kind of individual uh, solution to a, a problem that doesn't require systemic change necessarily. So complicated hacks. Um, I want to talk about software, but first I want to talk about a physical object. Um, they, complex hacks require infrastructure changes and community. Um, they may need strength or special tools, special expertise, uh, architectural or structural modifications to an entire environment. They probably need some kind of maintenance that's non-trivial. Um, this one that I'm showing here is called Lift Assist. I met this guy, Miguel Valenzuela, at Maker Faire and just was like, wow, this is amazing, this is awesome. He constructed this out of some PVC pipe, uh, like under $100 worth of equipment he got at the hardware store. He constructed this toilet seat lift uh, for his grandmother, um, who was going to have to move into assisted living uh, because she, they couldn't afford the like $5,000 toilet lift that uh, you know, she didn't have insurance. So he, he's an engineering student at Cal, Caltech, I think, and he just built her a toilet seat lift that operates off the actual water pressure of her house, and he installed it for her. So he was there at Maker Fair, and as we got talking about this, um, he was like, what do I do? Tell me, computer person, you know, tell me, internet netizen or whatever, what do I do to get this out there? Who do I talk to? How do I get this, uh, these plans and these designs out to like, people in other countries that might want to use this in, in, a developing, uh, in a developing world? And um, I did not have an answer for him, and I kind of went looking, and that's why I started thinking about all of these ideas together because I, I was like, well, you know, the way we do open source software would be the perfect model for publishing your designs and plans and evolving and, and working with collaborating with other people and spreading an idea. Um, but that doesn't really seem to exist. Uh, and it still doesn't exist. And two years later, after I talked to him, it's kind of sad. Um, another complicated hack is uh, uh, ramps. I've seen, actually, this is a, a good example and a bad example, once again. Um, I went looking for how to build a ramp because I wanted a ramp to my house uh, when I started using a wheelchair again. And uh, it's very hard to find that. Again, I think because of liability and because there's an industry built around it. Um, I did find this place, uh, the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living in Minnesota, has an enormous website. It's very Web uh, 1.0. Um, it's just some designs and some blueprints. And then along with that, uh, blueprints that tell you how to make ramp components and how to disassemble them and how to sort of combine them in different ways for different situations. Very great, very great. Um, they also explain the regulations. Uh, they link out to everything, like the ADA, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act regulations. Um, they then explain uh, ways to hire contractors and evaluate uh, contractors um, around what things will cost and how to hook up with like a Boy Scout troop or something that might come and build it for you. Um, so I thought that was great because they not only published the designs, but they included all this sort of meta, meta information about how to implement stuff and what might happen in the future and how you might change things and take it apart and put it somewhere else. Um, but the problem is it's all Web 1.0. It's hand-coded HTML pages. There's no way to feedback. There's no path to change or update these plans or contribute or collaborate, which I thought was a little bit sad. But they're very brave. I just want to give them a lot of praise because no one else on the, on the freaking web has done this, I think, because they don't want to get sued. I'm not sure. Um, try to make a, a, a nonprofit or an NGO publish something and, and see where you, how far you get. <laughs> um, 
Another complicated hack here, uh, this is actually another brave soul, the Center for International Rehabilitation, a big NGO, and they deal with like people who need prosthetic arms and stuff for land, from landmine problems usually um, in developing countries. Uh, they boldly published these plans for how to make a prosthetic arm out of a soda bottle um, and a blowtorch. So it's like a five minute process where you, you have sort of a model, they have like a plaster model of kind of an arm shape, and uh, you put the two liter soda bottle, over, plastic soda bottle over it, and then you uh, apply like a hair dryer or whatever. I think even a hair dryer will work. And you uh, apply some heat uh, and it shrinks down, uh, and then you cut away, you break the plaster and get it out, and you have this rather strong prosthetic arm, uh, which then the soda bottle, uh, the ingenious part of this really is not the soda bottle, but is the soda bottle mouth, which has a screw top, right? So you can screw on different attachments. I think that's the, the, great, the great part, is that you can you could stick a paintbrush or a fork or whatever on the end of your arm. Um, but uh, they put this on Instructables, uh, a, a, a sort of a how-to make stuff website, uh, tagged it up with lots of tags, and they're developing a whole section of, uh, of access hacks, which I think is great. Uh, but this, of course, the Center for Inter International Rehabilitation has like a five-page disclaimer. <laughs> don't try this at home. We're showing you how to do this, but don't really do it, and please don't sue us for God's sake. Um, so my feeling here is that there's these little attempts to put information out there, but there isn't like a, a, a developed model of how to build community around it. Um, and I think these complicated hacks need community just as any open source project does. Uh, these slides are pictures of uh, online uh, meeting, Gimp Girl uh, meeting, um, talking uh, about Second Life and uh, dis disabled representa representations in online of disabled bodies, like why you would choose to be in Second Life and have a wheelchair. I have an awesome steampunk wheelchair in Second Life. Anyway, um, or why you might not. So back to web access. I'm just going to leap subjects for a minute. Bear with me. Uh, quote from Tim Berners-Lee, the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. Yay, we love that. But accessibility is still an afterthought. Um, accessibility for developers is also, I think, still an afterthought. And unless you have a very stubborn developer who wants to join your open source project, you may never have thought, hey, how would I invite people with disabilities to participate in actually writing code and doing stuff and testing and doing the things that, that people do with software? Um, assistive AAC stands for Assistive and Augmented Communication. So AAC and Web Access um, does have lots of activity going on in development. Uh, software and web developers do uh, consider these things, access to info and user interfaces. Um, here's some ways that we, we think we can think about those things. Speech recognition, text-to-speech, eye control and switches, so people that may use like one switch or one button uh, or may use gaze, uh, um, so some sort of camera or tracking device that tracks what you're looking at to help you write or select things from a menu. Uh, and switches, uh, general website accessibility for the, to make a, a, a website more accessible to a screen reader and so on. Uh, software navigation is very important for this as well. Uh, in practice, again, this is, uh, this is bolted on or stuck on as an afterthought. Sucks for everybody and doesn't, doesn't open up any possibility. So here I think the possibilities missed are that developing for uh, people that have a particular impairment can have applications elsewhere. So if you've written software that is awesome, for uh, people doing voice control, you then are, you know, maybe somebody wants that for their mobile platform because people need to talk hands-free in a car, or um, it could have many other applications. Um, I think that the um, head mouse pointing devices are um, being developed from one side uh, for people with disabilities and from another side for gaming, and those sides haven't really met and meshed, and if they could, there would be some very interesting synergy. I have here a quote um, about contributing to free and open source software from Hal Finney, who's like a PGP hacker. Um, I hope to be able to read, browse the net, and even participate in conversations by email and messaging. Voice synthesizers allow local communications, and I'm making use of a free service for ALS patients, which will, make, which will create a synthetic model of my own natural voice for future use. I may even still be able to write code, and my dream is to contribute to open source software projects even from within an immobile body. That will be a life very much worth living. Um, this is a great quote from a blog post he made about um, finding out he had ALS and dealing with some of those difficulties. Um, and a lot of times if you have ALS or um, uh, muscular dystrophy, you may have to deal with like life on a ventilator and things like that. Um, what? ALS is uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, it's a myotrophic lateral, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the actual word, <laughs> sclerosis. Uh, but, uh, you know, 
um, a lot of people actually um, uh, choose to die, you know, um, or are encouraged to choose to die uh, through, like, assisted suicide, rather than think that they could uh, remain alive and contribute something to the world and, you know, interact with the world in some way. I think this is, I, I actually... Uh, really liked uh, Halfini's blog post because he was he he saw that connection I think immediately and just said wait that's bullshit why would I you know uh, why would I want to die uh, technology is awesome um, and will facilitate my my interaction with the world anyway uh, so uh, back to some accessibility projects I want to list a few um, voice banking uh, projects are out there most of them are proprietary and the reason I want to highlight a few of these is that I just want want people to know that they are out there. Um, but the most common ones and the ones that you probably are going to get help from some agency or insurance company or whatever is out there, whatever resources are out there, is uh, probably going to want to hook you up with some kind of proprietary solution. And uh, again, I, I hate that on many levels. <laughs> um, a Festbox is one that does voice banking. So you would record your own voice saying lots of things and giving you lots of phonemes to work with if you ever want to reconstruct um, uh, speech uh, in the future. Firefox is a screen reader integrated with Firefox. Um, NVDA, God, I've forgotten what that is. Anyway, <laughs> somebody here probably knows. Uh, Fullmeasure.co.uk uh, is a very good resource that seems to be listing um, a lot of other resources, trying to collect information and doing very good work um, through something called OATS. I've forgotten what OATS stands for, too, sorry. Um, the um, eViacam or Enable Viacam is a head mouse. It, um, this is very expensive technology. This is something that, you know, somebody would get charged thousands of dollars for and would be locked completely into some kind of entire proprietary system. Um, but this um, Enable Via Cam just is a head mouse tracking software um, so that you can control the mouse with your own webcam. So you could be looking at different places on your screen and your webcam that's built into your PC already can tell what you're looking at. And so this is like an interface that helps you configure the software you use uh, to work with either um, head control or eye control or just like if you could control like one hand or something like that. Uh, it's really neat. Um, and it runs on Linux and Windows. So this is a really cool project if you're looking for one to join. Captioning, the YouTube CC uh, closed caption uh, 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 project. It looks really good and really active. Uh, also seems extremely easy to join and something anybody could contribute to. Um, accessibility projects, let's see, eye tracking. The ITU gaze group looked very interesting. I just went and did some research and did an overview. So this isn't something that I do active work in, just so you know. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a, an overview of what's out there. Gaze talk um, does eye typing with prediction. So sort of like if you want to type the wrong word all the time, go for it. Stargazer and Cogain are two other projects. And iTube. I thought iTube looked really good because uh, you, can, you can navigate uh, through YouTube with your gaze and um, watch videos. Uh, the One Switch project is particularly awesome. That seems like just one dude, Barry Ellis in the UK. Um, he has a huge repository of information um, about switches that uh, you would use to control other devices. And he has a huge DIY section with, with photos and instructions of how to like take apart specific devices and do specific things to them. So that's really neat. Um, you might want to hack wheelchair controls, phones, games, computers, cameras, etc. Um, and he has ones that are like button switches. Uh, and he also focuses a lot on SIP and PUF interfaces so that you can blow into a little tube and control things that way. Um, there are, uh, there's, seem to be a lot of GNOME projects for accessibility in Linux um, and some kind of award that, I don't know if that's still active, but there was like a, a, a contest uh, with a monetary award. Um, uh, Orca seemed very, uh, very active uh, and uh, KDE um, Adept One is one of those middle projects where they are open source but not free, and they seem to be trying to make a viable business um, for themselves out of out of uh, making accessible Linux. Um, Ophenix is another one. I think uh, Ophenix is a, a company a nonprofit in Silicon Valley that uh, does things like put wireless into hospitals and, and assisted living so that people can possibly have the, even the potential to communicate out. Um, and they're trying to um, start a, a, a project to use uh, to make Ubuntu a lot more accessible and to sort of make a bundle of stuff that would be distributed. <clears throat> so the other thing I want to get across here is that um, disabled people with disabilities or various impairments um, 
are, um, are often hackers by necessity. Um, and that this is actually something that's good for software and for, for, for computer development. So because people can, that are extreme users that really challenge your software have the potential to make it quite a lot better. And we should be looking um, specifically to people with various impairments um, to be product designers, to be involved in the beginning of product design, and as testers. Um, I think that, that we have um, some uniqueness in being experts in pushing systems to work in unusual ways um, and to adapt them for new purposes. Um, for example, like David Wallace, who, do, who runs lifekluger.net, has a great site where he specifically talks about just this idea. When, when we found each other online and we were talking about the same thing, we were both very excited, and I wish he was here. But um, he does this, and he's somebody that is out there that could, uh, could easily be hired as a consultant, I think. Um, and uh, Glenda Watson-Hyatt is another person who, who is um, very good at the beginning of um, process um, of design. Um, quote from David Wallace here that I want to read. There's something inherent in the abundance of a digital world and dawning digital culture that requires even demands openness on many fronts. So um, here I just think there's an opportunity to really have a philosophical shift in how we think about not just uh, improving accessible assistive devices, but improving software by being more inclusive, more open. And the more inclusive we are, the better, uh, the better we will approach something like universal design, even though I don't believe universal design is uh, necessarily possible. Uh, problems here, as I'm saying, hire us, yay. <laughs> hire people with disabilities to work on your software. Um, the problems are, I'm often asked to do volunteer work. So people will be like, well, you want to help other disabled people, so could you just QA my site and help me make it accessible? And I'm like, okay, A, I don't know anything about web accessibility, go hire Nick. Um, <laughs> B, um, you know, Hire, what, you know, what the hell? I, I'm busy. I, I'm, I'm not only busy, but I'm in, you know, pain and exhausted. So why are you trying to make me do extra work? So I get guilted, uh, you know, into helping other people. And I also get sort of the assumption that because I'm disabled, I'm not working. And so I must be, you know, looking for something to do. Um, it's really offensive, actually. <laughs> so uh, another issue is if you do want to hire somebody with disabilities, they may have a benefit situation. Um, so I don't know how this works in uh, other parts of the world, but in the U.S., we have shitty health care. <laughs> um, and that means that uh, somebody's crucial to their life, you know, health benefits, like, <laughs> may be tied to the fact that they're making less than $600 a month. So I'm saying don't not hire people, but <laughs> on the other hand, hiring people can be quite difficult. And so if you are trying to hire uh, people who, who are living uh, uh, d dependent on, on, on a shitty health care system and government benefits, you may need to guarantee them some length of employment or work with a lot of um, agencies or something like that. Anyway, um, but I still think that, that, that that's a good thing to look into, and maybe that situation is different in, in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, I, I tried to look for places that are trying to collect this information. Uh, there's the Global Assistive Technology Wiki. Yeah, it's okay. It tries. Uh, there's OATS, ah, Open Source Assistive Technology Software. So they also have um, a big repository of some links out to information. AbilityNet uh, is part of global assistive technology. Uh, Dissipedia and WikiHow. Dissipedia is one guy's video wiki install, and he's trying to get more information on there, but I see that as an uphill battle. WikiHow, doing a decent job of collecting information. Instructables is doing the same thing. I think that there's um, some work that could be done in Wikipedia to make lists out to, 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 to collect uh, some information about open source assistive tech. Um, so there's some potential there, potential work there that I might just take my notes here and rewrite it up and make some, make some list pages in Wikipedia and wait for, wait for them to get deleted. Um, this project, the BBC Accessible News Reader, I thought was particularly important and it just kind of made my head explode. Um, what they do is they, they, they made this accessible news reader and it's specifically for kids, I think, or teenagers. It's meant to be for kids who are um, learning stuff and want to access the news and who uh, need to use scanning and um, switch software. So they made a web interface where the cursor selects different options in this menu, um, and then you, know, and it, and it, you can set the timer to sort of say how long it should hover on a particular choice, and then when it, it's on the choice you want, you whack a switch or whatever, uh, and, uh, and that selects you know, your option. And I think this is, um, probably something that other software has implemented, but I've never seen it on a website. 
Um, and I think they did a really good job of implementing it. I kind of wish they had it for grown-ups too, um, <laughs> and that they had more options and that they build it into more things. Um, it has also audio and font size settings, so you can, you can give it a lot of different um, configurable options for different users. Um, and uh, here's the, here's the, um, the interface for creating a user and for choosing what content blocks you have. There's just six content blocks, and one of them is like animal news, you know. Things like that. So it's meant to be interesting to kids without being totally educational software boring, if you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> has options for motor control and for audiovisual settings. So this made me go, hey, why isn't more software like this? Why don't we build this into free and open source platforms, publishing platforms? Great that the BBC did it, but what if they just released that out into the wild? Say how they did it. Talk about the specs. Um, have a word camp, you know, where we build it into WordPress. Right, you could you could build it into navigation systems is kind of what I was thinking. Um, build it into Drupal, that would be really cool. So um, I think software could, especially web publishing platforms, could radically rethink navigation and control systems to, to work with this kind of option, and it might become more widely useful or applicable. Um, another really great project that I hope um, gets more widespread is tactile maps. Um, there's a lot of people doing tactile map work. Um, there are mashups that are maps for visually impaired people. Uh, the Lighthouse for the Blind is sponsoring a lot of this work in San Francisco. Um, and within California, basically, because they have California state funding, within California, you can just um, email them or call them um, and say, hey, I'm at this address, or I'd like a map of this town or this area, and you can give them like a radius and a scope, and they will, um, for free, just snail mail you some tactile maps. Um, some printed, you know, on, uh, printed on, on embossing printers and that kind of thing. So, uh, really nifty project, and people are doing kind of exciting software development there. Um, it's a good thing to go and take a look at, and I think that will become more popular and more widespread as we get more 3D printers uh, in the culture. Um, I was actually just talking with um, Jason the other day about uh, text-only geographical map mashups. So, what about mashing up OpenStreetMap? And MUDs are interactive. How many of you ever played on a MUD or played Zork or Interactive Fiction or something? Aha, yeah. Okay, we have some nerds here. Um, <laughs> me too. Like, I wrote lots of MUD software and uh, lots of MUD areas and Interactive Fiction games and that kind of thing. Totally love them. Um, just because I'm a textual type of thinker and I think of things in words. I'm a poet and a writer. Um, so we were just talking about this and saying, well, what if we had Interactive Fiction style text descriptions of particular geographic locations. You know, you could do this either with OpenStreetMap, you could do it with some kind of embedded stuff. You know, I always have this fantasy that we'll have a little uh, chips in every uh, stop sign and it will just broadcast you all this information into your iPhone or whatever. Um, uh, so, so something could say, you know, you were standing in front of the convention center. To the north there's a stairway and a ramp up to the city center plaza. You know, there is a small mailbox here. And um, no one laughed. <laughs> Open mailbox, go north. Um, so um, th this would be very interesting as a collaborative project. Just pick a, pick a geographic place, uh, decide what a unit, you know, what a node would be, and describe what's there textually. I think that would be really nifty. Um, so I want to now skip to the negative side of, <laughs> of things. I've already ranted about the medical industrial con complex, and now I, I want to take a, a cue from Mako Hill's, uh, 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 Benjamin Mako Hill's uh, 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 keynote and talk about anti-features, creating systems that people with disabilities can't contribute to. That's an anti-feature. Uh, so, for example, Instructables, they're great. I love them. They're ready to sponsor contests for hackability, do-it-yourself, access tool stuff. But their site itself is not very accessible. So people with disabilities would have trouble communicating stuff unmediated to their uh, repository. Information silos, they suck. <laughs> Enough said. One-off solutions that aren't put into the public domain. So student contests and things like that, you often see, oh, I'm gonna have a contest where we contribute. Um, I saw one that was really neat that was um, sewing patterns. It was asking fashion design students to contribute uh, uh, clothing design patterns um, uh, to this contest for people with disabilities. Um, and it was a great contest, but they didn't take those designs and then put them anywhere. Like the reward was some money. <laughs> and they easily could have just said, all of the submissions are online under Creative Commons, yay. Um, so it's very hard to persuade people in this realm to do that kind of thing. Uh, people do it for charities. I talked to these people in England called Remap that looked like a very neat charity. They take engineering students and they pair them up with people with disabilities and they invent something for them. So you go, I wish I had a letter opener that was bolted to my desk that I could use one-handed 
or whatever it is that you need. And then you get this engineering student who goes, I'm going to invent you this thing, and it's going to be my thesis. And they invent it, and they put it in, and then they take a picture of you and put it in their um, fundraising brochure for their board of directors annual report. And nothing happens with the information. So, <laughs> so I was trying to talk to them and say, why don't you take all those things that are these individual solutions, put them online where other people could possibly, potentially, use them. And they said, well, but people with disabilities can't lift a finger to do anything for themselves, so nobody could really make this, so that would be pointless. And, and plus, it would probably violate someone's copyright or a patent or something. And I said, fuck you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to use you as my bad example in all my talks. Um, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> like, you know, the, the, anyway, yeah. Um, I consider that to be one way that vulnerable populations are exploited. But another way that vulnerable populations, as people with disabilities unfortunately are, uh, exploited is by people just treating their insurance company or government benefits as a cash cow. So um, that's uh, also disgusting. So something that you're using, buying for a medical device or a piece of software that you're buying to help you like access the fucking web is treated like this, you know, it's got to be some kind of thousands of dollars, uh, incredibly expensive thing. And this is, this is a terrible situation, actually, that, that, that hurts a lot of people's quality of life. Freaking out about liability, definitely an anti-feature. Oh, no, uh, what if I build, tell you how to build this awesome wheelchair out of bamboo and bike wheels, and then it breaks and you sue me? Um, you know, people can make their own decisions about what they're going to risk and not. And so I strongly feel like more information is a good thing. Um, and you can say, warning, do not use this bamboo wheelchair, do not taunt happy fun ball. Um, and, uh, 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 and let people still make their own decisions about whether they want to risk it. Selling out to industry. People really want to make a profit, so they go for the whole patent and try to sell it, and then the medical device company charges a jillion dollars for it. Um, examples uh, for charities, that was my remap rant. Yeah, so uh, having a charity situation model where you go, well, nobody could possibly help us do this. Uh, we're going to go do it for them is actually can be a very nasty anti-feature. Um, Here's another kind of an anti-pattern, uh, and another sort of sort of awesome, but sort of kind of disheartening example that I found. It's an organization called Arts for All that puts these art devices into schools, um, into like special ed classes, classrooms and stuff, uh, and they have a business called Zot's Art, and it seems like it's kind of some dude who has figured out how to make awesome things out of little motors. So he takes apart golf cart caddy carts, uh, uh, engines and lawnmowers uh, and old rotisserie motors and things like that that he gets secondhand. And then he uh, figures out how to put them in a housing and attach them to, to uh, walkers and wheelchairs to sort of bolt them on and put like paint and chalk and stuff in them. And then uh, all these kids at school can like zoom around in their wheelchair and uh, create enormous uh, paintings. So it's really nifty. Um, but the bad part is that um, he patented it all and uh, is very paranoid about protecting the designs and the patents, uh, even though this is a fairly simple idea uh, that people could benefit from uh, worldwide, probably, uh, if he would share some information. And then there's a really bad online store where you can go and, you know, uh, it, it, it's, such, it's actually just a, such an, a good uh, example of a bad example, because if you go and you try to buy something from the online store, you can't even manage to buy it because the interface is so awful. He could publish the plans as do-it-yourself plans and still sell the stuff to people, like he could still make it and sell it because even though you publish the plans, the schools in your local area are probably not gonna have it together to do this. So I feel like there's still an industry to be built on free and open source information, which I think is obvious to a lot of us and not to the rest of the world yet. Free wheelchairs, here's the big one. It's kind of a pet peeve for me. Um, there's these people called Wheelchair Mission, and they're religious, and they have this neat invention where they build a really cheap bike, uh, a wheelchair out of bike wheels and some parts uh, which they get made very cheaply in China, and a lawn chair, a plastic lawn chair. Um, so you see this guy sitting in the plastic lawn chair when, on his contraption, and it's a kind of a neat invention, and if, you know, if I really needed a wheelchair, I'd be like, yeah, all right, give me, a, give me the lawn chair. Um, but they, they take these things, they put them together in box kits, uh, put them in a giant cargo shipping container, which they can fit like 500 of them in a shipping container, and then they ship it to like Uganda or somewhere. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of, I think they might have a little bit of training and stuff. Uh, at the end of the line, uh, and they hook up with some kind of local shop. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think this is kind of an anti-pattern because the chairs are unmaintainable and very, very breakable. They're not like rugged, and if you're sending this wheelchair into some environment where people aren't going to be able to get a new one, you should probably think about how they're going to fix it. Um, it also has the effect of flooding the local market with a bunch of cheap, crappy wheelchairs, so it undermines whatever local industry and market might actually be there. 
so people are actually demotivated to develop industries, sort of like when you like donate clothes and they all ship to Africa and then there's no clothes making industry anyway. Um, thanks though, really nice thought, free wheelchairs, yay. Um, Whirlwind, Whirlwind Wheelchair International I think does a better job of handling the complexities. And again, this is kind of in the, we're doing a complex hack category and it's complex not just in an engineering sense but in a sort of social engineering sense, um, global. They make these really, really rugged $200 chairs, which is very cheap. My chair probably costs 5,000 um, bucks and it's not even that fancy. Um, but it's very lightweight and et cetera. How much, hey, hey, how much does your wheelchair cost? Uh, 6, yeah, okay, so $5,000, yeah, right. Um, so they make these very, very cheap, fairly lightweight, I've tried them, they're awesome, $200 wheelchairs. They partner up with local industry, so they find some like bike factory or something in Guatemala, they hook up with them, they give them the designs and the plans and everything, they're, they're not selling it, they're, they're, an, they're kind of a, 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 they're a nonprofit, an NGO. Uh, and then they, they, they actually walk through all the manufacturing and training. They hook up with local organizations and people with disabilities and they help them like start a center or a, you know, a maintenance repair shop. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, 3D printers are awesome. Uh, further thoughts? <laughs> we hate the medical model. Let's spread our wonderful philosophy, fight the power. Uh, consider extreme users and let's all trade ideas. Uh, physical inventions need more open sourciness and uh, document your projects. One more minute. Okay. In the future, will you, <laughs> will you be a sad, lonely person fumbling to epoxy tennis balls under the feet of your totally World War, War II looking hospital walker? Or will you be hacking your Burning Man jetpack in a vibrant community that supports serendipity and a culture of invention? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> a do-it-yourself approach <laughs> to hacking ability will help everyone. We'll invent cool shit, we'll open source our way out of nursing home prisons run by the medical industrial complex, and the future will be awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was really good. Um, here's a gift for contributing to our conference. Oh, yay, thank you. And let's have another round of applause for Liz.